Thank you, Professor Turner, for the kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, respected chairpersons, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, Professor Baum uh, could not be uh, here with us today because of acute health problems. Uh, and it's my honor to, to be able to give the presentation on his behalf. So uh, it has been indeed a long story since the first isolation of somatostatin about 45 years ago. And the first Indian Octreo scan registered uh, around 25 years ago. And the first yttrium uh, octreotide PRRT was performed in 1996. And in 2000, the first PRRT using lutetium 177. And it was only until 2012 that the phase three registration trial of lutetium dotatate took place. So we have indeed come a long way since the first Theranostics World Congress in, in, in Pat Burka in 2011, then the second in Chandigarh in India, and the third at the Johns Hopkins in February last year. So the concept of Theranostics, as has already been discussed at length, um, is basically to use the same diagnostic tool, um, which helps to define the right therapeutic tool for a specific disease. So we see what we treat. And of course, it has not been a new concept. The most prominent and the oldest application is, of course, radio iodine. But the strength is to provide a personalized health care, which is the right treatment for the right patient at the right time and at the right dose. So basically, targeted molecular imaging and therapy can be seen as a lock and key principle, wherein the targets are different antigens or receptors, and they are attached with uh, different molecular addresses, which bind specifically to this key. And depending on which radionuclide is attached there, one can use uh, the combination for imaging or therapy. And today, of course, I shall be concentrating on somatostatin receptors. So even the somatostatin analogs have undergone improvement over time uh, with the goal to improve the receptor affinity from oldest being Dota Talk to Dota Tate, and of course, uh, one of the latest being with so-called high affinity Dota Tate, which more binding to somatostatin receptors. We have been doing routi uh, routinely gallium-68 uh, PET st studies. We have performed up to more than 10,000 PET studies at the uh, Central Clinic PET Burka. And we make use of a titanium oxide-based generator system, which we, uh, which we have used in close collaboration with Professor Roche. Uh, with the very earliest type of generators, with a, a, a handmade generator, which you see on the left, to a, a fully automated click and start cassette based synthesis system for the daily routine production of radiopharmaceuticals. Professor Baum always likens this to a cappuccino machine, wherein the different peptides are the coffee pads, and you can insert the peptide which you want to get the desired product. We have been doing uh, about 1,500 gallium 68 PET CT studies yearly. And neuroendocrine tumors is the most frequent indication, followed very closely by prostate cancer. Now, this uh, case just shows you the difference in the diagnostic uh, ability of different uh, modalities. An American patient had a, an octreo scan done in the US, which showed only this uh, inoperable midcut tumor. He underwent a, a PRRT and the post therapy HA Dota Tate uh, scan showed many more liver metastases and also extrahepatic disease. He also undergo, uh, underwent uh, in the course morphological imaging for the initial staging, which showed a uh, total of four metastases, but a very high sensitive gallium-68 Dota talk PET CT uh, detected more than 20 lesions. So as has been already been uh, spoke, uh, spoken by Professor Hicks in the morning, this really has a significant management impact on uh, neuroendocrine tumors. So there is a significant impact on the management of the neuroendocrine tumors by the increased sensitivity of receptor pet CT. <clears throat> the patients are always evaluated before uh, PRRT by, uh, by gallium-68 receptor pet CTs, and their decision to treat is taken 
by the uh, SUVs uh, on the receptor pet cities. So the patient selection for a personalized uh, PRRT is uh, dependent not only on the strength of the receptor expression, but many other factors like renal function, the blood counts, the uh, proliferation status of the tumor, and of course, the patient-specific characteristics like Karnofsky index and so on. Now, earlier it has been uh, vastly debated that SUVs are silly useless values. But this study by our surgeon, Dr. Kamara, demonstrated a relationship between the SUVs on gallium-68 receptor PET-CT and the receptor expression on the immunohistochemistry. So we performed preoperative imaging in, uh, in these uh, neuroendocrine tumors, like this one was a very small eight millimeter neuroendocrine tumor of the ileum, which after resection was, uh, was examined using immunohistochemistry and uh, for all the somatostatin receptors one to five. And the tumor SUV max strongly correlated with the immunohistopathologically, uh, immunohistopathology scores. So this really so shows that gallium-68 receptor capacity provides in vivo histopathology. And this also translates into a dose-response relationship wherein the tumors which receive a, uh, a higher dose respond better to treatment in, uh, in uh, comparison with tumors which receive a very small dose and uh, do not respond to treatment. Now, uh, precision medicine is, uh, the future of pre precision medicine is based on digital histopathology, wherein the previous information like receptor density, the proliferation rate, and the genetic profiling, which Dr. Lawrence spoke early in the morning today, uh, really helps to identify the most appropriate peptide for the receptor pet CT. And this helps in therapy guidance for the management of the patient. One of, the, uh, one of the possibilities of a digitalized histopathology is to use the net typer, which is the quantitative analysis of the messenger RNA of the tissue samples. And it is indeed a very fast and automated uh, procedure which allows very quick results for the detection of messenger RNA uh, somatostatin receptor status. Like shown in this figure, in which uh, it was shown that the tumor has a very high uh, messenger RNA of SSTR2 and low of CXCR4, and that this analysis also uh, correlated well with the SUVs on gallium receptor PET-CT. <clears throat> so the indication for PRRT is basically progressive disease and uncontrolled symptoms despite maximum therapy uh, the plan for each patient is individual and is based on tumor board consensus of experienced net specialists. Now, our, our policy has been to apply frequent cycles, about three to six, up to 10, applying low or intermediate doses of radioactivity and thus a long-term low dose, but not a short-term high dose concept. In selected cases, we also, we also perform intra-arterial PRRT and uh, combine lutetium and yttrium in sequence or concurrently. <clears throat> a very important aspect of management is the standardized evaluation before therapy and systemic, systematic restaging of the patient. So, what about the results? As of September 30, 2016, we have treated about 1,400 patients, applying 5,000 cycles, uh, applying around two-thirds with lutetium and one-third with yttrium 90 based PRRT. <clears throat> and the primary tumors were mostly in pancreas and ileum, but also all types of pancreas to, uh, neuroendocrine tumors have been treated. Since 2004, we have screened about 2,300 patients, 676 patients were not uh, were eligible, but PRT was not perform performed uh, on the basis of the neuroendocrine tumor board consensus, which uh, uh, which 
decided that the patient should undergo other treatments. So between 2004 and 2015, a total of 1,048 patients were treated with PRRT. The PFS of all patients was 28 months. This case shows a long-term stable disease over seven years, according to resist as demonstrated by serial MRI. Excuse me. So this uh, case shows a long-term stable disease in a patient uh, who has been treated over seven years, according to RESIST. The longest overall survival was seen in primary tumors of the small intestinal origin, and also uh, patients with G1 tumors. This case shows a very good response to PRRT with a complete remission of the liver metastasis and a partial remission also of the primary tumor. This response is also seen on the uh, morphological imaging with a significant decrease in size of the liver metastasis. Now, uh, another PRRT study uh, was a multi-institutional registry study with prospective follow-up, which showed a median overall survival of 59 months. Now this case just shows you, a, uh, you the, the excellent response to PRRT in a patient with renal, uh, renal neuroendocrine tumor uh, who had multiple liver metastasis. And the, interestingly, the renal function actually improved after PRRT. Now this is actually a paradox to, the, to what is generally propagated by the oncologist, if I may say so. And this was indeed because of the excellent response in the primary tumor, which resulted in a, in a um, removal of the outflow obstruction, and that's the reason we think there was an improvement in the renal function. So another large study by Lisa Bodai uh, uh, incorporated 807 patients with neuroendocrine tumors, and they uh, checked for the safety of the kidney and the bone marrow. This paper was, by the way, the best clinical paper in European Journal. And they showed that uh, with treatment with lutetium alone, uh, did not have any grade three or grade four nephrotoxicity. And even with uh, standalone yttrium or a combination with lutetium had a very low nephrotoxicity. This particular example from our center shows a patient who has received 10 PRRT cycles over nine years and there was a uh, stable renal function over the 10 years. Now, data one study would be uh, covered in detail by Professor Schrosberg, but I would just show this uh, slide again, which shows a very promising and very, uh, very nice benefit in progression-free survival by the lutetium dotate. Similar results have already been observed from our study which showed a benefit in PFS of around 16 months as compared to sandostatin alone. Another study, called as COMPETE study, would be starting in 2017, which would compare PRRT with Evrolimus. Now, PRRT as a practical guidance document is already a part of several international societies, and it has also been a, in the guidelines of the ESMO in 2012. And as Professor Hicks pointed out, it's only until 2016 that it became a part of the guidelines of the ENETS. The new avenues uh, are a combination of yttrium and lutetium uh, radionuclides for PRRT, so-called tandem PRRT, which is concurrently applying lutetium and yttrium. In certain cases, one can apply intra-arterial PRRT, which, because of the first-pass effect, leads to very high doses 
either in the liver metastasis or in the inoperable primary tumors. PRRT may be safely and conveniently com combined with different other treatment modalities like the chemoembolization or CERT or RFA. Combination with chemotherapy has, of course, been uh, followed very uh, routinely here in Australia. Combination with Evrolimus is something which must also be considered in the future. And in interoperative use of probes after PRRT with lutetium-177 is, uh, is another option. <clears throat> and then we have improved dosimetry, radio protection, and improved peptides for imaging and therapy. The antagonists uh, label more uh, receptor 2 sites than the agonists, as shown by this autoradiography stainings which, because of the more binding sites on the tumor cells, led to a very uh, strong staining using the antagonists as compared to the agonists. And this results in a higher diagnostic sensitivity of the gallium 68 GR11 as compared to gallium 68 Dota TOC. These findings were also seen by the University of Basel, in which they performed a systematic study um, comparing the gallium 68 Dota TOC with OPS202 and showed that the OPS202 was able to uh, detect at least twice the number of metastases. There was also a comparative trial with, uh, between lutetium dota tate and GI11, which showed that the antagonist um, gives a significantly higher tumor dose and also a higher tumor to kidney ratio uh, than the agonist alone. So, for a personalized dosimetry, we have indeed a long way to go. Otherwise, it would be like shooting in the dark. Since the first dosimetry in 2004, we have done about 1,280 dosimetry cycles in more than 800 patients. Mostly, it has been Dota Tate and Dota Talk, but also several other peptides, ligands, and antibodies. So this uh, shows a comparison of the three peptides with minor differences. There are no major clinical differences as such. So dosimetry really helps to find the optimal peptides for PRRT. Another interesting perspective is to find a radionuclide with a longer half-life, which would permit a delayed imaging and a pre-therapeutic dosimetry. One such candidate is Scandium-44, which uh, shows here that a delayed imaging, imaging at four hours post-injection detected many more lesions with a high target to background ratio. Another very interesting uh, radionuclide is terbium, which has been described like a Swiss knife with different possibilities like alpha therapy, beta therapy, Auger electron therapy, spec and PET imaging. And this is because of the different decay modes of the, of the radionuclides and the, and the long half-life, which permits pre-therapeutic dosimetry and therapy itself. From the PSI Willigan group of Christina Muller, they performed the first proof of principle studies using Terbium-52 Tota NOC, which showed an impressive uptake in these implanted tumors. However, the, the, the delayed image uh, was obtained post-mortem. Of course, we don't expect such a scenario. We don't want such a scenario in humans, but I guess that was just a one-off case. Another uh, new uh, softwares are, are being developed for, uh, for accurate and autom automated dosimetry protocols. So we also performed the first, first in human Terbium-52 Tota TOCPED CT, which showed encouraging results at 24 hours uh, post-injection. And incidentally, uh, very recently, we have performed the first terbium PSMA pet CT, which uh, could have a potential for predictive dosimetry. So I would just like to, uh, towards the end, present the first ever pa patient treated with atrium 90 in Europe that was treated by Professor Baum in 1997. So this was a 15 years old boy uh, status post chemotherapy, he had a very poor oncological prognosis of survival of just six months. He underwent three cycles of intra-arterial 
Yttrium 90 uh, PRRT. And at 20 years old, uh, you can already see the difference. And three years after, after the last therapy, he almost returned to normal life. And what for a German boy is very important, he was able to play football again. So that's basically our mission and goal, is to prolong the life. Of course, an ideal case scenario would, would be a complete remission. As in this case, an internal medicine specialist who presented to us in February 2016 with severe pain and he had left his private practice, but he was able to work again as a doctor after therapy. So to summarize, PRRT is effective and well tolerated even in very advanced neuroendocrine tumor cases. The median overall survival from the start of treatment is between 46 to 59 months. However, in small intestinal neuroendocrine tumors, with more than 90 months. It leads to a significant improvement of clinical symptoms. Cure is rarely possible, but excellent palliation can be achieved. PRRT is a part of the clinical algorithms of major scientific and clinical societies. Standardized, standardized treatments are usually applied and guidelines are available. Significant kidney damage can be avoided or reduced. It should be performed at specialized uh, centers because it requires individualized interdisciplinary treatment. And the future perspectives to, uh, to, uh, to consider are gene genetic characterization and clinical features, or genomic profiling, uh, new avenues for personalized dosimetry, for finding out the biological information regarding the tumor cell and its microenvironment, and new interface between molecular imaging and circulating biomarkers. So me and Professor Baum would like to thank all our national and international collaborators, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Gulkani. Are there any questions? While you're thinking, I have one. In your list of indications for radionuclide therapy with peptides, you said uncontrolled symptoms, comma, progressive tumors, despite maximal conventional therapy. Do you ever treat first or second line, and what indications do you use for that? Uh, well, first or second, uh, first line is uh, is rare, but second line we we uh, we perform routinely, and uh, from from that statement, what we are trying to uh, to stress is that the the patient's uh, progressive disease is of course the most important uh, criteria, or with uncontrolled clinical symptoms as in functional neuroendocrine tumors, um, and um, at least the first line treatments. Must have been must have been considered in the patient. Is there any other question? Um, you mentioned mentioned earlier that you uh, were using SUVs to select patient uh, patients for therapy for PRT. Is that uh, correct? Yep. And uh, what kind of SUV values are you using? Well, it has been already published in several studies. Uh, there, there's good good guidance uh, based on uh, SUV values, uh, but 17 and uh, se between 17 and 18, that that's the uh, uh, that's the uh, consensus in in two, two of the studies. But of course, we are we are deciding uh, depending on the on the uh, tumor burden as well. Is it uh, because SUV is uh, reflect the uh, the uptake at one time point, but not necessarily the retention in the tumor and even less in the healthy tissues. So um, are you denying uh, patients with like a, a SUV below those values? Um, are you de ah, denying okay. therapy? Uh, no, the, uh, no, for that, I must say there is no strict cutoff. Uh, there, there one has to, because in this case, when, when uh, you're, you're basically talking about patients who are let's say strongly FDG positive, but mildly calcium 68 well, positive. Let's say borderline uh, yeah, yeah. uptake, but do, you don't use absolute SUV cutoff no, to for decide. That, for that, there is no exactly. SUV cutoff. Thank you. Have you looked at your intra and inter-observer errors on your 
estimation of SUV in your own practice? You mean just the estimation of SUV? Yes. Estimation. Well, you're using it as a criterion for selection of patients. We're using SUV max, so SUV max is generally yes. There's no, there's no, uh, there's, there's no variability at all. It's max. Everyone agrees, and you're confident of your accuracy. Yeah, if it is the max, then then I'm confident. All right. I mean, if my system is good, then. So if the if the maximum doesn't quite make it to your criteria for treatment, then you come in with your personalised therapy and determine that for that patient, as a physician, you will treat them. Um, for those with borderline. Up to yes. For, those for, with for the for the for the borderline, one one has to then consider the other factors into account. For example, if the patient has run out of therapy options, uh, is, is actually the last line of treatment, then, then one can uh, try PRT as the last option. Yes. Of your 2,000 patients put up and you rejected around 1,000 or 1,000 and go ahead, was there any particular pattern as to what led to those patients not being put up? Was there a sort of a dominant rejection criteria? Yeah, uh, rejecting criteria was, was, the, uh, was the SSTR uh, negativity. They were negative on, on gallium-68 CT scans. Can I just ask one philosophic question? There seems to be two schools of thought. One either treats patients with a fixed administered activity in a fixed cycle length, or one says that you're using personalised therapy, which I take to be discretion to vary those parameters, and you talk about personalised therapy, is that do you treat on standard operating procedures ever, or do you always individualise the patient's therapy? No, one has to have a, a certain SOP, obviously, and personalised uh, means that uh, not these um, four times 7.4 gigabacterial uh, with, with three months in between, uh, that, that would be a, a fixed regimen. For example, some of our patients get uh, just two, two treatments upfront. Some of them uh, get six treatments upfront with shorter intervals between the cycles. With addition of, uh, addition of um, capacitor bin, for example, that's another variant. So there are certain SOPs which we go, but the, um, the final protocol would be personalized, if that makes sense. If there are no other questions, I'd like to thank Dr. Kulkarni very much for his presentation. <laughs>